Okay, thank you everybody for coming by. Today, we're gonna do some more metaprogramming. Uh, for the past couple days, we had some fun using metaprogramming to do a command line argument parser. That module probably isn't complete. It will get, ex it, it will get expanded in the future, but um, it's pretty nice. It's pretty fun for what it is. Um, and so I wanna do some more metaprogramming uh, to do uh, SOA, Structive Arrays, kinds of things. In the early demos of this programming language, uh, I demoed an SOA feature that was a built-in to the language, but I deprecated it a while ago because I didn't like how much complexity that it was adding to the core semantics, and I felt like it was a little too specific. It didn't cover every use case that you would want SOA for, and by the time we did cover every use case, uh, it would have more of a performance impact, and I wasn't happy with that. So I've got, you know, I've had a general plan for about a year of what's the better way to do SOA plus some other things. Uh, but of course, because we're all very busy, um, I've been doing other things than that. But we're finally at the point where I'm thinking, hmm, um, maybe we can take some steps there. So in, in the roadmap that I have in my mind for how to do SOA, there's, there's a user level component and a compiler feature component, right? And the user level component is, hey, let's use the features we already have to get as much SOA functionality as possible, right? And then we should get to a point where, you know, we can make data structures that have nice memory properties and stuff, but there's still, a little bit of an interoperability problem because functions that don't expect to take those structures won't be able to. Um, this will still be much better than something like C++ gives us, but uh, once we get there, there will be some compiler features that we can add to get us even much further. But I figured that today would be a nice day to actually do some of the user level portion of that, right? Now, a lot of people, I mean, some people who, uh, frequently attend this channel and channels like this probably know what SOA is, but a lot of people may not. So we'll talk about that for a second. Probably more than a second, probably many minutes, right? Okay. So one thing that programs want to do a lot is math. They want to do a lot of math on things. For example, 3D games want to do a lot of transforming points in space, you know, whatever. There are lots of different kinds of math. Um, what does math look like? Well, I'm not, I'm not going to be specifically writing code here. I'm just kind of doodling in this buffer that's the same. Eh, let's make a new buffer. Let's make a new buffer. Okay. So, um, Let's say you want to do some operation like x, uh, x plus a, where x is like some coordinate and a is like a constant, right? Um, well, you don't usually want to do that just for one thing. Say I've got a bunch of points, like all the points in an object, and I want to do this operation for all of them, right? Then uh, the C style thing would be like, you know, for uh, I equals zero, I is less than 67,432, I plus plus uh, X of I plus equals A, right? So you're, you're doing the same operation on a bunch of things. Um, and that's fine, you know, um, but there are ways that you could start to do this faster, right? So starting a while back, CPUs recognized that it's a common thing that you might want to do to perform an operation like this on a number of pieces of data at once, right? And so the, this paradigm was concocted called SIMD, right? There are a bunch of things. There's also like a MIMD and there's sort of a MISD, although not really, like nobody ever does that. Um, but for acronym closure, MISD is a thing. Anyway, so what this stands for is single instruction, multiple data, right? And the observation is like, 
well, if we know that we want to have programs that do a bunch of additions, for example, then instead of just having one little thing on the chip that adds, and in reality, there's actually more than one, but it's just t talking hypothetically, instead of just having one little thing on the chip that adds, um, let's pack some number of them together really close. So we could have like four of them, right? And then, and then on your chip, you might, you might be able to do like x1 plus a, x2 plus a, x3 plus a, and x4 plus a, all at the same time, right? Um, and, and so instructions are added to let you do this. Um, so this would all happen, for example, if you're lucky, if you're on a good chip, then you can do these four uh, additions in maybe one cycle, whoever. Who knows about latency versus throughput, whatever. But in theory, you know, you could probably do this in the same time as it used to take you to do that. And you could imagine that that makes your program a lot faster. Like, wow, I could do things four times faster, maybe. I could do things eight times faster. If it's like eight wide, this is, is you'd say this is four wide, right? And so forth. Um, however, there is always a but, right? And here's the but. It's a big but in this case, so Sir mix -a -Lot should be happy. Um, the way that this sort of thing works is that the SIMD registers typically for these instruction sets are much bigger than the usual registers, right? Um, so a typical register might have been 32 bits or 64 bits. Let's just say 32 bits. This is back in the days before it went 64 bit maybe, right? And so these X's are just single precision floats, so they're all 32 bits, right? So this is one 32-bit operation floating point. This is a four-wide 32-bit operation floating point, right? Okay. Um, well, how do these X1, X2, X3, X4 get into these adders so that the CPU can do them all at the same time? Well, um, you got to put them there. How do you put them there? Well, if you had to just go do four separate loads, right, and then do the add, right, if, if one, if, if your scalar, add, whoops, if your scalar add looks like load and then add, right, and your vector add looks like load, 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 add, um, well, you might say it's still faster, right, because four of these would have been would have been this, right? And and now we do this, so it's it's five instructions instead of eight. So that's not that much faster, right? We wanted four times faster, and it's not. Uh, but also, you know, CPU is doing things out of order. These loads are things that could typically be slow. They overlap with each other anyway, right? And so. I don't know. I mean, it's the performance of this, I guess, is unpredictable. But if it's slow, it's going to be dominated by load. It's not going to be dominated by add, right? So saving a few ads is not necessarily that great, <laughs> right? You would like to not have to do all this work, right? Instead of saying load, 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 add, you want to just be like load, add. You know what I mean? And you want to be sure that this load goes as fast as possible. OK, um, that I don't feel like that was the greatest explanation, but it'll have to do for now. So so wh what does that mean? What does it mean to load these things in? Right. Well, OK. This is where Intel used to fight with game developers all the time and still does probably. Right. So say say my points in my game are vector threes. Right. So I'm going to go C style again here for a second. I've got a struct vector three, right? It's x, y, z, oops, I'm, I'm float x, y, z, right? No, no surprise there. Okay, if I have a bunch of these in memory, if I've got my 60,000 of these in memory that we were talking about, how are they laid out? Well, if we assume that the alignment of this is four so that we can pack these tightly together, then we go like X, Y, Z, 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 right? Okay. 
Now we're talking about 3D points all of a sudden, so we don't just want to do x plus a. Or let's say, let's keep it, let's keep it to that. Like you might want to do things to y and z also, right? But let's just say for now, we still just want to add a to all the x coordinates and not do anything else, right? In order to load the x coordinates out of here, you have to read things that are like, let's just say, uh, buff is the pointer to the base of this array. We're going to, we're going to cast our array of vectors threes to like an array of floats or something. And it's called buff, right? You want buff sub zero, right? Buff sub three, buff sub six, buff sub nine. Those are your first four loads, right? And if we, if we turn that into bytes, it's like buff plus zero, buff plus 12, buff plus 24, buff plus 36. And so how do you get these memory locations into a SIMD vector without issuing a bunch of loads that may also have math because like you're adding to the buff here, right? And depending on how much the instruction lets you calculate, I mean, maybe you have to like load integer constants, like it could turn into a mess really fast, right? Um, well, that's what SOA is for. Right. So people like Intel were like, you know, this is way back in the days of SSE one or whatever. People like Intel were like, hey, you dumb game developers. Right. How, how many is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten. So so, hey, you dumb game developers, instead of storing stuff like this, why don't you just store all your data in your entire program in the following way? Just put all the X's together and then all the Y's together and then all the Z's together. And you could even imagine that they're not quite contiguous. So maybe, maybe they're even in different places in memory, but they're like this, right? And then the benefit of this is if you want to load the four X's and do something with them, you just say load uh, 128 bytes starting at this address. And it's very simple. Bam, you go from memory into the register and then the register goes to the um, to the math unit and does the thing, right? Okay. First of all, as someone said in chat, but my object orientations, right? And that's true. But, you know, I'm not a big fan of object oriented either, but it's true that like programmers want to think about the vector, right? Even if they're not thinking about an object, like this is just the conceptual unit in the program. You want to be able to pass individual vectors to things and like writing an entire program this way is a big headache and Intel was like never really able to get people to do that very much except when they paid them a lot of money to do Intel sponsored demos right I, I don't know that that's that's an exaggeration some people would do this in in core parts of the program and whatever but I think very few people ever wrote an entire program that use data this way the whole time, right? Okay, so this format here, we didn't used to call this anything, but then once this sort of paradigm came around, Intel said like, okay, this, or maybe Intel didn't coin, somebody coined this, right? Probably someone in academia coined this. This is called AOS, right? Which is array of structures, right? And this, is called SOA, right, is a struct of arrays, right, or structure of arrays. Um, and this is much more efficient for feeding SIMD units. It also has some other properties that are better. Okay, so since the early days of SSE, SSE1, right, we've gotten several versions of SSE, we've got AVX, we've got like ARM CPUs that have like whatever their thing is, I don't know. Um, PowerPC probably has something. Uh, ARM has Neon, yeah. So, so everybody has their own version of this now. And a lot of these actually realize like, oh, uh, we actually want to help people with like loading the data into the thing so that they don't actually have to lay things out in SOA all the time, right? So the problem is not as bad. The problem of feeding these 
uh, math units is not as bad as it used to be. However, it still is more inefficient to do that, right? So, um, you know, th there tend to be in instructions now where you could load four X's into here with maybe not that much overhead. It's still overhead that you would like to get rid of though, because the whole reason that you're doing this is to go fast. So you want to go fast. You don't want to go like half as fast as you could, right? Um, and then there are also complications. So even if you have an instruction that says load buff zero, buff 12, buff 24, and buff 36, um, you know, you may cross like a cache boundary in the middle of this, which can penalize you, depending on the implementation, can penalize you in different ways. And sometimes those penalties can be very bad, right? And so you got to go fast. It's true. And so, um, so it's still just better to be able to do this, right? Because you can feed, if you're going through here, peeling off X's, right? You know the X's are contiguous. If you're doing, for example, four at a time, and you know that your cache uh, line width is, uh, what did we say? These are 32 bits. So if you know that it's a multiple of 128 bits, then you'll never cross a boundary um, in just one read, right? And so you can just make things very clean and avoid penalties, right? And that's why you would want to store things this way. Also, there's many other issues like, uh, you know, maybe I'm DMAing to some coprocessor or some other device that wants these things to be in a particular format and gets even more unhappy. So the thing, the thing to understand about general purpose CPUs these days is, um, so on the one hand, CPUs that we use are astonishingly fast. They are marvels of engineering technology. Um, on the other hand, they're also pretty slow compared to what a special purpose piece of silicon made to do one specific job uh, using the same manufacturing technology, right? Like the same feature size, you know, when people say 10 nanometer, seven nanometer, right? Um, using that same feature size, a special purpose device can go a lot faster. And the reason is because CPUs do a lot of things to make them easier to program. Whereas special purpose devices tend not to do that, right? Because the use cases are more specialized, so they can demand more of the people who want to use them, or maybe it's just um, you know more specifically what people want to do. So GPUs are an example of that, right? GPUs render graphics way faster than CPUs do, um, not necessarily because the underlying silicon is better in some way, although it can vary, right? But it's just the GPUs know what they're doing, and they're designed to do that thing. And they're not doing all sorts of like stuff that makes things easier for you, right? And they're very deeply pipelined and all sorts of things like that. Is, that's a whole many, many lecture topic of its own. Okay. The point being, the point being, if you lean on all these things that CPU makers were kind enough to put into the chip to make it easier to program, you're going to take penalties for that. And the less that you lean on those, the less of a penalty you'll take. And as I mentioned, if you're communicating with other things, um, there's a limit to what I can say here because we have NDAs with many other parties, but I think that from multiple parties, some of this has been discussed, right, uh, in public, but you're gonna start seeing computing devices uh, with large, uh, large installed bases, right? Large customer bases that have more and more in the way of discrete additional processors that do special purpose things. And the reason for that is pretty easy to understand. It's like, we're kind of reaching the limit of how, you know, in order to deal with Moore's law slowing down, we've gone to this model where CPUs are multi-core, right? And we keep stamping out more and more general purpose cores and software kind of has a hard time using all those cores very effectively, especially if it's a user program. If you're running a server, maybe you could just imagine, oh, we put a lot more 
users in parallel on this server. But for like a desktop program, it's getting hard to use all that compute. But if you decide to allocate some die space to doing a different job that you know that a lot of people want to do anyway, then you actually provide additional capability that people are able to use effectively, right? Um, so, so that's all. Okay, so now SOA is not quite the end of the thing, right? And so the SOA that we demoed way back early, maybe it was 2015, the SOA compiler feature that we demoed um, was partially about feeding SIMD units and stuff, but it was partially also just about having good cache behavior. So let's say, let's talk about that for a second. So let's say you have something that's not about doing math, but it's just, uh, let's say you have a general entity in a game, right? And maybe it's got a position, right? And, and but, but maybe it's got an ID, right? So, and that's like a U32 entity ID. This is something that you use to look it up in tables or whatever, and to refer to this from other entities without having to use a pointer, right? It might have, um, it's, you know, uh, it might some flags, right? U64 entity flags. Let's put, the, well, oh no, this is a better packing. Um, it might have, I, I don't know, entities have so much stuff. Um, you might cache, so if it's in a collision grid, you might say, um, you know, U32 uh, cached collision grid index. You'd probably need more information than this so that you know to inv that this is invalid. You might wanna do a generational index. Yeah, okay, let's do that, right? So that way, every time you rehash the grid or whatever, this increases and then you know this is not valid anymore, whatever, okay? So a real entity in a real game has way more things than this, all right? Well, if you have them stored like this, then if you were iterating over an array of entities and you just wanted to test the IDs for something, right? Then that's fine, that will seem to go fast, because like I said, your CPU is doing a lot of things to make programming easier. And one of the things it does to make programming easier is it'll prefetch ahead of where you are in the cache, right? So the first time you read the first entity, the CPU might not be expecting that. And it might be, whoa, 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 hold on, we don't have that, right? And then it has to go ask main memory to bring that entity over, right? And that might take a long time. It might take, let's say 400, 500 cycles to do that. When you thought that this load would only take one cycle or a couple if it was in cache, right? I actually don't know on a current on a current generation Intel chip, I actually don't know how many cycles load from cache is. I assume it's at least two. Um, anyway. So so then you might say, well, I, I'm trying to be a, a cache efficient and cache knowledgeable programmer, but I know that as long as I store all my entities in a contiguous array, then when the CPU brings that first entity over, it'll also actually bring the later ones because it knows I probably also want to look at those and it's right. So the later ones will be in cache. And then when I get toward the end of the later ones, the CPU will go, aha, you know, he's going through linearly through these things. So let me go get some more before he needs them, right? So modern CPUs are very good at doing this. Um, and it's true. And so as a programmer, I, be, I might be thinking, aha, I am using a very, a very cache efficient way of doing things because my entities are packed together in memory, just like these XYZ XYZs were packed together. This would be more like, uh, you know, position, I'll put a space, entity ID, entity flags, cache index, I'm gonna shorten these names, right? Cache generation, that's for entity zero, right? And then, we have entity one and entity two and so forth. And that's what my memory looks like going left to right. And so I look at entity ID for one entity and this is slow because we, we didn't have this available in the cache. But then once we get it, when we go here, the CPU was smart enough to already get this one, right? So we hit it and then we go here and the CPU is already gets this one. And that is way faster than if you do things the weird object oriented way where these are heap allocated and uh, and you're essentially random accessing memory. That is tremendously slower. So this 
is probably hundreds of times faster or I mean it depends on what the CPU is doing for you but a lot faster than the Strostrup way of doing things right that's not fair but you know the way a lot of people writing C++ programs do it where they new an entity on the heap every time they want one okay but it's still not that fast right because as I'm fond of pointing out current day software is very 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 slow right and just because you're not very 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 slow anymore doesn't mean you're not at least very slow or just slow right you want to be fast how do you be fast? So, so one thing about this is, well, okay, the CPU might be prefetching these for me, but I'm not actually using that much of the memory it's prefetching, right? I'm just looking at the ID, and then optionally, if the ID matches, then I'm doing something, right? ID is a dumb example because it's probably unique per entity, uh, so you'd probably use a hash table, but imagine I was like checking the flags or something, all right? You know, we're, we're looking to see if a certain flag is set. So many entities may have that flag set, all right? Um, well, you can end up in this situation when your memory bandwidth limited, right? Because, okay, here's the thing. When Senator Joe Lieberman or whoever it was said that the internet is a series of tubes and everybody made fun of him, they all showed how, uh, how like everybody who thought they were a smart Twitter internet person made fun of him for saying the internet is a series of tubes, but that's actually what it is, right? And in fact, not only the internet is a series of tubes, but your CPU is a series of tubes, all right? Well, it's a series, it's, it's series and parallel sets of tubes, all right? So there's a tube going from your memory to your cache. <laughs> you can't just dump a truck on it. There's a tube going from your memory to your cache, and that tube only has a certain bandwidth, all right? You can only fit so much stuff in the tube every second. And in a case like this, especially if your entities are big, even if your CPU is working hard to get all the data through the tube, um, it, uh, most of the data it's getting for you is getting thrown away, right? And so, you may be limited by the rate at which it's pulling in data that you're throwing away. You know what I'm saying? Like it can pull in 12 entities per, well, whatever, 12 million entities per second. Um, but if your entities were smaller, it could get 24 million entities per second. And if your entities were smaller than that, it could get 36 million entities per second because the bandwidth is some number in bytes, right? Okay. That is certainly a thing that could happen to you. So don't forget about the series of tubes. So what do you do about that? Well, you could try to make your entity smaller. You could break it into multiple structs that are stored different places. This is one place where like a component system actually would help you because like if you have different components and they're stored in different places linearly like this, then you uh, use a higher percentage of your cache. Oh, one question you might have is like, well, if the CPU is so smart, why does it get all the memory? Why doesn't it just get the little pieces of the memory? And the answer to that is the way caches usually work is they get a range of contiguous bytes that's of a significant size. Otherwise, everybody would go insane. That's just how it works, right? Okay, so. This is where SOA can also come in, right? In addition to like just having things next to each other to feed this kind of a thinger, um, then imagine if instead of setting up my entity this way, we're just gonna have three because I'll get tired of typing really fast. Instead of doing it this way, you just had position, 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 right? Entity ID, entity ID, entity ID, entity flags, entity flags, entity flags. Let me actually use my Emacs features here, right? So cached index and then uh, cached generation. I didn't think I was gonna type this all out, but whatever. Okay, so you could do your memory this way instead. And let me delete these spaces so that they're the same length, you can see. Okay. Fit them all on one line. Okay, 
Same amount of memory arranged differently. Again, not arranged in the way that human beings necessarily like to think about it. But um, now, if you wanted to go through all your entities and just look at the flags and test them, look, all the flags are next to each other. You'll still take a hit the first time, or you'll still take a miss, right? The first time you look for this memory, it won't be there and you'll wait. But after that, you're 100% efficient in terms of what you're reading because it's all next to each other. This, okay, so this was way faster than the heap thing that everybody does, but this is way faster than this. And in fact, you know, depending on the specific system architecture and all this, um, this both might make your current thread go fast. It might just leave more memory bandwidth open for other threads. Um, there might be a heat impact of not doing this work that allows you not to throttle. Like there's all sorts of things, right? All sorts of benefits. So it's good. It's good to put things together. Except it's really annoying, right? Okay. And then the final thing to say about all of this is that this pattern starts being kind of crappy eventually. All right. Um, for two reasons. One is uh, how do you address how do you address the individual elements mathematically? And is that fast or is that slow, right? So if you're doing SOA, like I think here we had 10 things, right? Let's make it nine things for now, right? So let's say you want to get the first X, right? Let's say we're, we, we've got buff again. The first X is buff plus zero, right? The second X is, let, let me label this, uh, X coordinates, right? Buff plus zero, right? Buff plus four, buff plus eight, and so on, all the way up to uh, buff plus 32, right? Because we said we have nine and this is, uh, this is the eighth, right? Or zero to eight, <laughs> right? And then after that comes the Y coordinates, right? So then you've got, uh, well, buff plus 36, buff plus 40, buff plus 44, uh, all the way up to buff plus, uh, is that right? Wait. Uh, 68. Yeah. And then Z coordinates, let me pad this out. Z coordinates starts, you know, buff plus 68 and so forth, right? Okay. Well, th these numbers could be annoying, right? But not only are they annoying, but they depend on the number of items in this array, okay? So if I have one thing with nine elements and I wanna get the Y coordinate, the first Y coordinate is buff plus 36. If I have a thing with 10 coordinates and I wanna get the first Y coordinate, it's buff plus 40, which means that the function that's like loading these things or whatever it's doing with this, it can't like be statically baked in where the offsets of these things are, it has to like know how many elements there are and do a multiply and all that. And that's annoying, right? Whereas with this, if these are tightly packed together into an array, you just know the offset, right? Um, I mean, it's a little bit of a different case. Like you might have a multiply to get to the base of the next entity, but then once you have that base pointer, you have constants, you have known constants to all these elements, right? Whereas here, you don't really have that thing. Um, I mean, you might like, uh, you know, depending, I don't know, it's complicated. But the point is, this is annoying and you don't necessarily know as much as you want to. Um, at compile time. But then secondly, what happens if this is uh, really long? What if we have 60,000 of these? We have like 60,000 X's 
and then we get to the Ys, and we have 60,000 Ys, and then we get to the Zs, we have 60,000 Zs. Um, that's kind of annoying, because then you know you're always taking... I mean, we start getting into issues that vary a lot depending on architecture. And I'm not schooled enough on all the different architectures to know what's going to happen. But uh, I mean, there's like cache associativity things that could happen, right? So for example, if you... <laughs> I don't want to go into a cache associativity explanation. In, at first, because it's a big... It's a, big, uh, it's a big topic on its own, and we haven't even gotten to start programming yet. But second, I'm also not an expert in cache associativity. But the, the upshot is, if you think of a cache as like a, a hash table that, um, that think of a cache as like a hash table. In hash tables, you can have a situation where multiple items hash to the same element, right? Um, you can have multiple elements in memory hash to the same uh, location in a cache, and then they can fight with each other, right? They can evict each other, and, and then you have very poor performance in that case. Whatever. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe I'll go do reading up on some specifics for various architectures, and we'll come back and do a SQL stream about that one. Um, but anyway, whether, you know, you may or may not take a weird penalty from these being far away if you have 60,000 of these. Um, you certainly wouldn't be able to have the option of having them all be close together, which you might want, right? Like you might want, oh, okay, hold on. Let me, let me do this in the reverse order. So, so the reason, apart from the distance, the problem is if this varies based on the length of the array, you're not in control of whether you will have a cache associative, associativity problem, right? Because it varies. Sometimes with some arrays, you will have a cache associativity problem. Sometimes you won't, right? So, um, well, and then the other thing you might want to do is maybe I want to be kind of SOA, but I still want all these things to fit in one cache line or whatever, right? So you might want to go XXX, whoops, I'm capital now, XXXX, YYYY, Z, 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 X, 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 Y, 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 Z, 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 Z. This isn't going to be like the same number of characters because it, it was a multiple of 10 or whatever. But uh, you might want this, which is kind of a hybrid of both worlds, right? So this is, uh, hey, it's easy to load into here. Um, we probably get better if we were just going to run through something like this. Uh, in this kind of a case, we probably get better memory performance because we visit less wasted memory um, and then jump to a next region and then jump to a next region. Although who knows, the jumping to the next region might confuse the CPU, so you might have to prefetch or something, right? But anyway, depending on what you want to do, you might want this instead of this. If you're doing this, how many Xs are there? Are there four Xs? Are there eight Xs and then Ys, right? Anyway. There's very many things that you might want to do. And that was why I felt like this kind of feature should be in user space uh, or controllable by user space and not totally built into the language the way I had it in that first prototype. Anyway, this is called, of course, because acronyms have to stack on each other, AOSOA, right? Which is Array of Structs of Arrays. And this is like probably the most controlled uh, highest performance thing for SIMD, right? Where's my Halloween costume? Uh, today for Halloween, I'm dressed as someone who pretends to know how CPUs work, when in reality, I don't know that much. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, those are the, ba okay, that's a good place to break, actually. Um, so I think next we'll start actually programming now that we've done this intro. Um, are there any questions 
on topic, strict on topic questions about what we have covered here. I should join the CPP Standards Committee. No, I should not. Believe me, I should not. Why not both? SOA seems a better thing, not missing the cash. Well, okay, I mean, SOA is basically AOSOA of your array length or of infinity, right? Oh, okay, so, so let me point out one other thing about this, which is um, if you're doing AOSOA, you tend to do a block at a time, right? You tend to like, you tend to like call a function on, you know, this block and then that block and so forth. And at that point, you get all the benefits of knowing where everything is stored with a constant offset, right? And very often you'll pick these so that they're a power of two apart from each other. Maybe, maybe not. That might not be convenient, but you know, it could be. And then like, Bit shifts will get you to the next address, or bit shift and add, or wh whatever, right? Um, now you would just—I don't know. It depends. Like what the fastest thing is depends on the CPU. But that's that's the point of doing AOSOA. Whereas with non-AOSOA, it's like well, it's a little different. But but this okay, right? I don't I don't mean to say that this is strictly better, right? This is better for some things. Um, Oh, one other thing, actually. If you're talking about this kind of use case, not the SIMD use case, but the um, just general game data use case, then naive SOA kind of sucks. And the reason why is the following. What if I just want to be able to add and remove stuff from my array? What happens if I've got this all tightly packed together and I want to add one more vector three what do I have to do? I have to reallocate the whole damn thing, right? And put a space there and a space there. So I have to recopy all this data and then I have to put an X and a Y and a Z, right? And so then you'll do a, a typical strategy to avoid doing it that much where you, you allocate extra space that things could grow into, right? But then, then your SOA is even a little more confusing because you're going to have your extra space at the end. Let's put underscores to represent the extra space, right? And then you have to know not just the length of the array, but how much of it is filled. You have like two variables and thinking about those two variables might make you a little bit slower. And then even after you've done this, you still have to take this hit of once in a while, I still have to reallocate this whole freaking thing, right? Um, and that might lead you to temptations like not contiguously allocating these things because it's such a pain in the butt, right? Whereas with AOSOA, it's a little different. Like you do want to have some empty space, but that empty space is always at the end. Like let's just say, let's just say we had, you know, one, one bucket, two buckets, right? We have four things per bucket. So we have one bucket, two buckets, and then in the third bucket, we only have two things. So we would go XX empty, empty, YY empty, empty, ZZ empty, empty. That would be our third bucket. And so if you were trying to make something that runs fast, you could actually have two versions of the procedure that runs on a bucket. You could have the one that runs on full buckets, and that's the one you call almost all the time, and it's maximally optimized. And then just at the very end, you have a thing that just runs on partially full buckets, right? Or maybe, depending on your use case, you can just stuff these with zero in the end and not worry about it and pass it to the full bucket thing. Who knows? But the point is, if this gets very long and I want to add a new bucket because I, I have another vector. Let's say this one fills up first of all, right? So I put two more vectors in here. Now I'm full. I want to add a new bucket. I just put a new one on the end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, right? Um, now the question is, <laughs> if this is all still stored linearly, then I still have to realloc and copy, but you might store it in a two level way where each bucket is in like an array, right? Um, and, and are hopefully contiguously allocated 
but sometimes aren't, right? And that would allow you to avoid the copy, right? So what is the smart thing for any of these? Really depends. <laughs> I'm not wishing to claim that, that any of these is uh, the best for any specific use case. I'm just talking about the different things that there are. And what if you have to delete? Well, uh, I would say try not to delete. Um, if you do have to delete, then there are two obvious strategies. Uh, one is, it's the same as you do for linear arrays. One is just grab the item from the end and copy it earlier. Now that's more expensive in a thing like this, right? If it's a thing like this, like this then you just grab the entity from the array and it's like one mem copy to put it early in, in the array as long as you're not a C++ person who tries to destroy and recreate all your things all the time, right? It's just one move of memory. Um, in this, it's multiple moves of memory, or in this, it's multiple moves of memory because you have to copy all the things. Hopefully, you don't do it that often, or hopefully those moves are all still kind of fast, right? But it is, there are trade-offs to everything, right? And so, if you had a situation where you were mostly reordering things and not very often going through them linearly and not very often loading them into SIMD registers, then maybe this is the best one. Maybe the classic way is the best one, right? There's no universal best thing. It's about what are you trying to do and what is going to work best for that. Does the LLVM compiler rearrange data to take advantage of stuff? No, that is illegal in most programming languages. For example, in C and C++, uh, this has to stay in the order that you said it should. And there are good reasons for that, and I'm very glad that they do that. Um, you know, there, are, there have been academic projects about rearranging data structures. Um, I don't think those tend to work very well in the real world. Like, I think a programmer who knows how to make things fast is much better at that than a compiler is. Um, how would you implement this in C++? I don't know. You probably could do some really gross template thing in C++, but it would be very hairy. Um, our goal today is to do it nicely. Uh, what tools, if any, do you use to detect and profile cache misses, or is that generally not necessary? Um, you know, there used to be some tools from Intel, like, you know, VTune and like the iPeak tools and stuff that were pretty good at that. The problem is that as CPUs have gotten a lot faster um, than in the day when I used to use those tools, they don't seem that useful anymore. So like when I try to use VTune today, I downloaded it a couple months ago and tried to use it. Uh, it is borderline unusable because it uses like Windows multimedia sampling to see what your program is doing at any given time. Um, and that sampling rate is like every millisecond, which is an eternity in, in modern computing. Or I think you can do half a millisecond, but that's just forever. Just, I was trying to run it on the compiler to, to profile the compiler and no usable data. You would have to run the compiler 10,000 times in a loop and the program isn't really set up to do that. And so I'd have to do a lot of engineering just to make it V-tunable, right? Um, different platforms have more specialized tools. Uh, so for example, uh, game consoles have tools that let you see some pretty good things. Um, unfortunately, uh, I can't even tell you about those because I'm sure my NDA would be violated there, right? But um, they're pretty good. Uh, but they're still, they still are not you know, they're not foolproof. There are definitely simulator tools where you, you put your code into them and the simulator says, oh, uh, this is gonna be bad, right? You're gonna take a cache miss here and whatever. Uh, and those can be very helpful, but they're also like simulators. They don't represent necessarily exactly what's gonna happen. Um, so I don't have a good solution to profiling those. Fabian might know more if anyone wants to ask him about what's the best way to do it. I actually asked him by email and he didn't really tell me anything, any news I could use, but who knows? Maybe you would get a different result. Um, 
If you were multiplying multiple members by the same struct with a single scalar, would you want to do AOS? Multiple members, how do you multiply by a struct? Do you mean from the same struct? Multiple members from the same struct with a single scalar, would you want to do AOS? So that you got both members at the same time. Yeah, I mean, if they were contiguous in memory, you might want to do that. Okay, I mean, there's all sorts of like, you know, I just wanted to end the discussion there, but it gets really complicated. Um, you know, uh, adding a vector to a number or whatever is a very simple operation. There's lots of things that you might want to do that would mean that maybe this isn't the memory format that you want things in the SIMD registers, right? Maybe you want your SIMD registers to contain XYZ1, 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 because you're going to do some transform or like a cross product or something, right? Um, who knows, right? Now that said, I believe there have always been instructions to load memory from XXXX into the first slot, second slot, third slot. Like this kind of thing, I believe, goes all the way back to SSE1. So this would have been fine, probably. I, I'm kind of making this up, so it might not be true, but but definitely today, going from this to this is fine. Um, but there's it's just to say that there are many things that you might want to do, right? Like doing using SIMD effectively is just about figuring out what's the equation you want to evaluate, and then how can you make the instructions do that thing? And it's not always having like by like packed in the same. You might have some really wacky cross terms just thrown in there. Who knows, right? Do you structure your games around SOA up front or later when the expected feature is stabilized? I find it difficult to add modifications to SOA code TBH. Yes, um, it is very hard. And that's why a lot of people don't do it because it, it makes your code harder to modify, among other things. It makes it harder to think about. Um, our goal today when we start programming this is going to be to do something that's not hard to think about and, and not hard to modify. And we'll see. I don't know how good of a job we're going to be able to do eventually. You know, Long term, this is a bigger job than just one stream. But um, we're going to do what we can do and, and see what happens. A good size for AOSOA is the page size as well. Yeah, quite possibly. I mean, to be fair, I haven't done this stuff in a long time. And CPUs are different from when I did do it a little bit. And when I did do it, I wasn't super serious about it. So the caveat is some of the stuff I said might be wrong. Don't believe me. Um, believe someone who does this daily, of which there are not very many people in the world, unfortunately. Like. I mean, there's a lot of people at Intel who deal with this daily, but they don't write like serious games that depend on the result being good and also need to do complicated things. Like what will always happen at a CPU vendor is they'll just say, well, don't do that, right? Do the thing that's fast on the CPU. And it's like, but we need to do that because it's what our game needs to do. That's, that's been the constant tension, right? So uh, yeah, don't believe me, believe Fabian. If he corrects me on any of this, that's fine. Um, For AOSOA, wouldn't you want to control the stride based on the SIMD capability of the target CPU? Uh, probably. Well, th there might be many reasons you want to control the stride. The thing is, if you want your code to be fast, you don't want the stride to vary at runtime, right? So you might bake several different, I mean, thinking about different PC CPUs, who knows? I would probably pick one that is representative, right? Maybe somebody like Rad Game Tools actually detects the CPU and does a lot of different things. But for a game, I would probably just pick one. But I definitely would be like, hmm, on something like the PlayStation 4, where I know exactly what the machine is, if that optimum size is different from a typical PC, I would do different code paths. And you don't want those to be dynamic at runtime. You want them to be fully baked in as a compile time option. And that's part of what we're going to do is make that easy and simple.
I'm reading through more questions now. <laughs> Someone had to say the word protobuffs. Kind of goes without saying, but a fixed size array that you never grow and never delete from is also an option. Yeah, I mean, to be, to be clear, this whole growing and deleting is, um, only applies to some things. So, you know, if you've got a game, if, you're, if you've got Call of Duty, and Call of Duty has some soldiers running around, even though they're animating and they look very dynamic, the mesh for that soldier is probably just like one thing. Like it's one array that's a fixed size that never changes. And because that's very efficient, and you don't have to worry about it, right? Actually, in a modern game, especially if you're selling hats, like if you're Valve Zynga Corp, um, then you probably need one for the base mesh of the guy and one for the hat and one for the bling bling belt and one for the, the shiny boots that you can only buy in December. Um, but each one of those things is a fixed array of, of data, right? We like fixed arrays of data in video games. Um, on the other hand, if you're talking about the number of entities in the world, in most games, you just have to vary the number of them. And so, whatever, you know. Someone was asking about C++ AOSOA, Edward. Edward Komet built it and YouTube link video efficiently coding for modern CPUs. Okay. Check that out if you're interested in that. You worked on Call of Duty and all the meshes are broken up into chunks for calling purposes, FYI. No, I don't believe that. So character meshes are definitely not broken into chunks for, well, if somebody did that to characters, they're on crack. Okay. The, the world, certainly is broken into pieces for calling. You don't want to render like an entire world mesh. That's bananas, right? Um, so you definitely want, like if you have a giant building that somebody's in, you don't really want it to be one mesh, right? But an individual size thing like a character, I, I doubt that that's most, okay, let me, let me not say Call of Duty specifically because I've never seen the engine, but most video games, would not break a character into multiple pieces and except for swappable pieces like hats or whatever right and then um even if it were multiple pieces each of those pieces would be a fixed size array that's the real point of what i'm trying to talk about is the fixed size array Characters are separated into several smaller units called serfs. I, I doubt that that's for culling. I can imagine some other reasons to that, but culling doesn't seem like one. But who knows? I, again, I don't know anything about that specific engine. That would seem like a very bizarre choice to me. I'm sure somebody probably had a good reason for that in like 2005 and then nobody ever changed it since then. Okay. Let's actually start programming. Actually, let me heat up some water. Um, and, uh, and then we're going to start programming this. It, and, and we'll see if it goes well. Very short break while the tea water heats up.
Any final very serious questions before we move on? Serious questions. No jokey questions. How does SOA affect data layout for sending to GPU? I mean, these days, these days you sort of decide what your data layout is on the GPU. That's the difference between like OpenGL DirectX 9 and today. Is like your shader decides how it wants to read things and you decide how they should be formatted. And um, I have not done enough GPU optimization to know what is best in various cases. GPUs tend to store things a little differently in memory than CPUs do and stuff, right? So for example, texture maps on GPUs tend to be tiled uh, for, again, for cache reasons. Like they tend to be tiled into squares or tiny cubes if they're 3D. And the reason is because if you're going across a texture, you like don't know what direction you're actually going, right? Well if your model is scan lining, right? Who knows? Like if it's a tiled renderer, it's even a little bit different, but whatever. But the point is, uh, the direction of travel from one memory location to another is like anisotropic on a texture. You can't necessarily predict uh, which way it's gonna be. And so just the, the way that you set up data for good caching tends to be different if it's spatially correlated data like a texture if it's something different just like an array of like particle positions that's not sorted in any way it might be different did we use an soa system in the witness um i didn't i don't know if somebody did for other things but it wasn't a system it would have just been like let's copy this data into soa manually 